while the author never says it outright. The story of Baki takes place in our wood. Besides the fact that the action happens in Tokyo, and that multiple real-life personalities have cameos in the show, the most convincing argument to support that theory is the establishment of a judiciary system and the visible presence of global politics. Unlike a lot of other shonen manga that neglect the development of the environment surrounding its characters, there is an evident emphasis put on the construction of believable governing institutions in the Bakiverse. The introduction of politics to the plot makes possible the depiction of a realistic setting in more ways than one. First off because it anchors said plot in a parallel world similar to your own, and secondly because it allows for organic interactions between the cast and governmental representatives, which often make for juicy power fantasy scenarios. The Maximum Tournament proved particularly effective in its ability to give visibility to multiple countries. Between Retsu who put China on the map, and fighters from Africa, the USA and Western Europe showing up to brawl, there is no doubt that their Earth is a twin model of ours, with a similar topography. This also means that they share political parties, which is confirmed with the Garland flashback, that showcases his comrades from the USSR discussing his undying loyalty for Mother Russia. Besides making for a cool backstory, it also serves to hype up his strength and situates him as being someone even the top brass of the Apparatchik respects. The same narrative process is repeated when Canada makes a brief apparition during the Vietnam War, before getting obliterated by Ujiro. Since armies and the politicians that back them are globally accepted as the paragon of influence and power in our modern world, they serve as the yardstick that will help the reader evaluate the character's strength as they clash against them. This process is a little different when it involves back his father, because a large portion of his character is centered around his title as the strongest creature on earth. When it comes to him, his relationship and habit of engaging in conflict with entire countries participates more in a slow build-up towards an eventual god status, as predicted by this Canuck general. The biggest offender of this type of theatrical performance is of course the USA, which receives heaps of exposition throughout the show, for reasons I developed in the military video but will detail further here. American presidents are given many more operations than their Japanese counterparts, which can seem strange before you realize that they always end up being the butt of the joke, as the ridiculing of an old enemy often looks more like revenge fantasy than an actual attempt at characterization and power ranking. The list of presidents who got humiliated at the hands of Itagaki includes Bill Clinton, George W. Bush Jr., Barack Obama, and Donald Trump, with each one having to bend over and submit to the will of Fujiro and Baki, who represent the home team. Despite the sometimes childish nature of these segments, their effectiveness cannot be denied, as watching a single man make the elected leader of the strongest country in the world his bitch does a lot to establish the position of said character within the scope of the story. This is made especially effective by the fact that these actions are not without repercussions, and should result in severe consequences under normal circumstances. It is clearly established that the Tokyo we see in Grappler Baki isn't an anarchical land, and that anyone who lives in it falls under the same jurisdiction, the caste included. Japanese laws are presented as being a carbon copy of what they should be in our reality, which makes the transgressive actions of our heroes much more impressive. It really goes to show how stretched the suspension of disbelief is in most shonen that seeing a character face some real trouble for murder gets you to raise an eyebrow. This realistic political setting also extends to the differences that Itagaki establishes via the introduction of ethnicities. After all, political discourse is first and foremost a struggle for power, with or without the cover of acting for the good of the people. In a world devoid of plurality, divergence in ideological opinions cannot exist, and neither do the clashes that should result from it. And since Itagaki wasn't about to introduce a complex political spectrum to this story on top of all of the other themes he's already juggling, he chose to go about it the easy way, by using racism as a factor of division between people. It's never turned into an excuse to go on long tirades about how evil it is, and the Baki series as a whole is far from being woke. Rather, the author sort of places it there for all to see, without attributing a label to it, which, on top of removing its stigma and making it look purely functional, 
also makes it appear forced. The characters seem to immediately notice when someone is in Japanese, and they always feel the need to express it out loud. This is of course for the benefit of the reader, who would have absolutely no way to tell that two characters are of different ethnicities, considering Itagaki draws whites and Asians the exact same way, the only exception being Chinese fighters because they are darker, and black people because they are, well, black. All of that is done in an effort to present a believable state of affairs, with international powers having a strong presence in the plot. By having us buy into the idea that the governments and institutions of Guaplebaki are legitimately powerful, Itagaki gives us a chance to feel more involved when they finally clash with the characters. The struggle between the individual power of the fighters and the world of politics isn't just a throwaway line. And this element of the story is a cohesive glue that holds the plot together and develops even more importance in later arcs. It greatly participates in creating the mythology that shrouds the Bakivus and helps balance the realism that is so important for our engagement in the story. In a sense, it allows for both an exciting adventure and a somewhat believable one, which is the trademark of any great legendary tale. This effort towards world building culminates in the absolute domination of the political sphere by Yujiro Anma, who effortlessly manages to subjugate the most powerful governmental institution of his country, staying true to his title of strongest creature on earth. All of that is justified in the story by his attempt to prove that he is leagues above Gaia in terms of strength, which, when you think about it, is only a thinly veiled excuse for Itagaki to flex his narrative muscle and give us some good old Yujiro pawn. As exaggerated and shoehorned as this event feels, it serves the very important purpose of making the reader believe that the Anmas, and the rest of the cast by extension, are capable of pretty much any feat in terms of fighting power. You might think that this is completely superfluous considering that shonen manga characters are more or less superhumans in their own right. But you have to keep in mind that while the limits of what the medium can show are infinite, the limitations that an author has to impose on his own writing for it to remain believable and exciting need to be clearly delimited for his story to have any chance of staying consistent. By establishing that Yujiro, the number one warrior of his series, is able to take on an entire army by himself, Itagaki greatly raises the ceiling on what his roster is capable of, while at the same time depicting it in a way that speaks to us and remains within the realm of what is conceivable yet impossible. Considering how much more ridiculous the series gets as one arc succeeds another, this is an absolutely necessary addition to the plot, as it helps alleviate the wild goose chase that the power level's escalation brings forth later on. During that process, it also transcends its status as a gimmick, as the politics of the Bakivers get more and more fleshed out and defined as the story advances, and I'm looking forward to sharing my thoughts about these plot developments with you in later videos. This was the last part of my analysis of the manga Grappler Baki and the conclusion of this 5 episode series dedicated to studying the work of Keizuke Itagaki. I had a lot of fun writing and editing it, and I hope you had a good time listening to it as well. Thanks for watching, and have a good day.